Those of us old enough will remember Socket 3 and all the different flavors of CPUs that were available for this platform. I'm happy that the time has finally come to look at 486 CPUs, the first PCI motherboards, EDO memory and all the other great features this platform offered. My first PC, an AMD 486DX4100 is still safely tucked away in Germany, waiting for me to restore it one day to its original state. But that will be a story of another day. Today we are about to embark on a journey to explore the Socket 3 platform and look at a variety of motherboards, plenty of CPUs with different architectures, the cache system, memory and timings, PCI, ISA and VLB video cards and so much more. Along the way we will have to fix most of the hardware, CPUs with bent and broken pins, motherboards with damaged memory sockets or active charging circuits and non-working graphic cards. And all this to understand if the Socket 3 platform would have been enough to get Tomb Raider from 1996 running at an acceptable frame rate. By now you may have understood that this is going to be a project spanning multiple videos. If you're looking forward to everything we're going to cover in future videos, then please subscribe to my channel so you won't miss any of those videos. Let's start by having a look at the Soyo SY4SAW2 motherboard. This board was given to me in exchange for a Voodoo 3D accelerator with an 8MB memory mod. Someone already fixed some traces and replaced the rechargeable battery, but left behind a major problem. The original rechargeable battery has been replaced with a 3 volt button cell. However, the charging circuit is still in place. When I power on the board, you can see that we get 4.74 volts on the battery terminals. This voltage is coming from the 5 volt power rail directly from the power supply. The person who replaced the old battery was probably not aware of the charging capabilities of this motherboard. We need to find the circuit that is charging the battery and cut the supply to our non-rechargeable lithium button cell battery. On 486 boards, the circuit to recharge the battery is usually right next to the place where the battery is soldered to the board. Here we can see a set of resistors, capacitors and diodes. A diode allows current to flow in one direction only. On most diodes you will find a marking that indicates to which side the current is flowing. In our case it is a black ring around the diode. And I found this middle diode, labeled D2, which is connected to 5 volts of the power supply. Current flows through this diode when the board is powered on. It then travels through this resistor and eventually reaches the battery terminal. This circuit needs to be adjusted, so that no current is flowing to our battery. But before we zoom in, I would like to tell you about PCBWay's big Christmas sale. You still have time until 31st of December to get up to 50% off your orders. I just placed an order to get snow themed 30 pin sim modules for more 486 and socket 3 content. White is one of the colors I haven't used yet. I'm really curious how they will turn out. Oh, and don't forget to take your chance opening 3 of the lucky boxes for your chance to win amazing prizes. Links to pcbbay.com are in the video description. Under the microscope we get a much better view of the circuit below the button cell battery holder. We already determined that the diode labeled D2 is the one that connects to the 5 volt rail of the power supply. After the diode there is only one resistor which then connects to the battery. All we need to do is to remove diode D2 to break the charging circuit. Unfortunately while looking around the battery holder I did notice that there was still some corrosion going on. I do not want to leave the board in this state because sooner or later there will be something that is going to fail. There are still corroded pads, vias and traces. And as you will see, some components are close to failure. All of this needs to be fixed to ensure a long life for this board. After I'm done, I will apply solder mask to all exposed traces to make sure they are protected. Now it's finally time to take care of the diode. 
The three diodes used here are standard silicon diodes, which have a relatively high voltage drop of 0.6 to 0.7 volts. That is a normal value for those diodes, but there is a small issue caused by the lower voltage of our 3 volt button cell battery. The original rechargeable battery had a voltage of 3.6 volts. After the diode, we ended up with a voltage close to 3 volts. With the current diodes, the voltage provided by the button cell battery would drop to 2.4 volts, which may prematurely result in a battery low warning from the BIOS. It is an optional step, but I'm replacing D1 and D3 with Schottky diodes. Their voltage drop is about one third or around 0.2 volts compared to the silicon diodes. Unfortunately, the diodes I have currently at hand are through hole diodes and need to be modified to fit on the board. I just bend the legs on both sides so I can solder them to the pads. Once I was done, I cleaned the area with isopropyl alcohol, which unfortunately removed the markings on the diodes. And now the board is ready for our first CPU, an Intel 486DX266. This CPU was the first that implemented clock doubling, which means that internally the CPU was clocked at twice the speed of the system bus. So why did I pick this CPU and not, let's say, this Cyrix CPU with 40 MHz? Well, based on system requirements and the README file of Tomb Raider, the game requires a Pentium to work well. One point in the README file answers the question if one can run the game on a 486 system. We do not recommend running the game with a 486 processor regardless of speed. Yes, even at 100 MHz. That is because the animated sequences will not run, only a squeech sound or hissing noise. Nevertheless, let's start with this 486 clocked at 66 MHz to understand why Eidos Interactive decided to exclude 486 CPUs as suitable systems for Tomb Raider. But there is a tiny issue we need to take care of first. You may have seen the video about the Pentium Overdrive, which was also part of the 5 CPUs I got from a scrapyard. All those CPUs had banned pins when I got them, and I will attempt to rescue every single one of them. But let's talk a bit more about this Intel Pentium 486DX2 with 66 MHz while I'm straightening every single pin of this CPU. As I said before, this was the first CPU that employed internal clock doubling. It runs two internal logic clock cycles per external bus cycle, and was therefore significantly faster than an Intel 486DX operating at the bus frequency. The DX2 was released in 1992 and could virtually run every game title available for a couple of years after its release, right up to the end of the MS-DOS era, making it the sweet spot in terms of CPU performance and longevity. With the dawn of 3D gaming, however, time was running out for 486 CPUs and their comparatively weak floating point unit, which 3D games heavily relied upon. The DX2 is available in two flavors. The earlier version, codenamed P24, is a CPU where the level 1 cache employs the right through cache strategy. The CPU that is under the microscope right now, getting the pins straightened, is such a CPU. The later version, codenamed P24D, has an updated level 1 cache that is capable of operating in write back mode. Coincidentally, such a CPU was also among the 5 CPUs from the scrapyard. But it won't have its debut in today's video. And although Intel had already released the 486DX4 with 100 MHz in March 1994, codenamed P24C, the DX266 with write-back cache was one of the last 486 CPUs ever released by Intel in October 1994. Thus, the 486DX266 seems to have a later codename compared to the clock triple DX4100. We will see all CPUs sooner or later in one of the upcoming videos. After about 1 hour and 30 minutes, I was done straightening all pins on this P24 or DX266 CPU with write through level 1 cache. Luckily, none of the pins broke off or was so badly damaged that I couldn't straighten it properly. What do you think about the result? You may remember the outcome of my video where I fix a Pentium Overdrive CPU. I have a feeling that a drop in socket test will be mandatory after a pin straightening marathon. I think the CPU passed this test with flying colors. The only thing left is to set the jumpers on the motherboard for this 5V CPU and hope that this CPU is working. And we get a video signal. This is the second working CPU from the pile of 5 CPUs I picked up at the scrapyard. Let's quickly verify if this CPU is operating in write through mode. The CPU identification utility confirms that the internal level 1 cache is indeed operating in write-through mode. Now we can finally get to test Tomb Raider on this Socket 3 system, which is equipped with 32 MB of FPM memory. And 
and here is Lara Croft, running on a Socket 3 platform with an Intel 486DX266. I am sure you can see that this game is anything but smooth. Since we don't have a frame counter, we can only guess how many frames per second this CPU is capable of delivering to the screen. I would guess that we look at a frame rate of around 15 frames per second at the resolution set to 320 by 200. Tomb Raider also supports a higher resolution, but when I change to 640x480, you can see that the game is no longer playable. The game becomes a slideshow instead of an action-packed adventure game. The Intel 486DX266 struggles to get a decent frame rate in Tomb Raider. However, I am still impressed that it does run the game at all. Remember, the CPU was released in 1992, while this game was released at the end of 1996, over 4 years later. Without a hardware upgrade, the only option left to us is to reduce the size of the render window. And while this does improve the frame rate, it makes it challenging to fully immerse into the game world. The README file cautioned about potential adverse effects of running Tomb Raider on a 486 system, but aside from the sluggish performance, the game did well during my brief testing period. In the next episode, we are going to explore whether the right back model has any performance advantage over the right through version. There will also be some more content regarding the charging circuit of the Soyo motherboard, which gave me way more headache than I have mentioned today. As you may see, there is one component missing. We will explore how this missing capacitor affected the system, and how I discovered that this capacitor was the culprit. If you don't want to miss the next video, then make sure that you have subscribed to my channel. And please like the video if you enjoyed today's content. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.